Welcome to Moments with Marianne. I'm so delighted we're spending this time here today. We have an amazing show lined up. Our first guest is Dr. Michael Lennox, and he's here today to talk to us about his new book, Llewellyn's Little Book of Dreams. Now, Dr. Michael obtained his master's and doctorate in psychology, and he's known as one of the most respected and sought-after dream interpreters in the U.S. So let's welcome to the show Dr. Michael. Thank you. It's great to be here. Oh, what a joy it is to have you here. So how did you get, I mean, gosh, because you've got such an amazing education and background, how did you get involved in dreams and dream work? Well, you know, it's interesting. My, I didn't get my master's and my doctorate in psychology until much later in life. I didn't even start graduate school until I was about 36. But I've been working with dreams since I was a kid. This was something that came out of my childhood and adolescent experience. And it's, I can't, it's the story is the true story. It started with Fiddler on the Roof. <laughs> Literally, the, the, my mother was a music person and had lots of wonderful albums, including the show album to Fiddler on the Roof. And in the musical Fiddler on the Roof, there's a dream sequence. And in the beginning of this dream sequence, the character, Golda, says to her husband, tell me what you dreamed, and I'll tell you what it meant. And then it's followed by this really dynamic, fun piece of music, right? So all my childhood, I heard this idea, tell me what you dreamed, and I'll tell you what it meant. So cut to my 15-ish, 16-ish years old, um, I stumbled upon Freud's interpretation of dreams. Now, I was already fascinated with dreams, as some you know imaginative kids are, um, then I picked this book up and I read it and I got that, although I don't think I really understood what Freud was writing when I was 15 or 16, I certainly understood that at a very high and significant level that dreams were something that could be looked at, explored, interpreted, analyzed for great value. And that just sort of set me off into the social experience of, you know, kids and friends in social settings say, oh, I had the craziest dream last night, and I just remembered Golda. And I would say something like, tell me what you dreamed, and I'll tell you what it meant. And I'm not sure exactly how that worked, because it was a long time ago, and I don't remember, but people responded to what I had to say. And that sort of set me off into a, 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 a chasing down this idea that dreams could be interpreted. So when you started doing your dream interpretation, I mean, gosh, and it seems like you were just the right person to be doing this, you know, because it's, it's really grabbed you throughout your lifetime. You know, did you see common patterns would start to develop when people had dreams in regards to spiders or you yeah, know, yeah, sure. different things? <laughs> well, certainly I noticed that people were dreaming of the same things over and over again, Um what I just, I'm going to, to, to answer this question, I'll sort of jump ahead to now I'm sort of in the world, I'm, you know, recognized as an interpreter of dreams and someone who can teach this and be in it, and I had someone who was actually helping manage my career at the time said to me, you need to figure out what it is you do so you can teach other people how to do it. And I found that idea really overwhelming when she suggested it, mm-hmm. but I took her to heart, and I just started watching what, what happened when I was listening to a dream, and I discovered it was actually very, very simple. Dreams are stories. They're told in a language. The language is, in, is like symbolic in nature, and the meaning associated with a, a, a thing that appears in a dream, whether it's an object or an animal, the meaning that's universal, that is most <clears throat> widely held by the most human beings on the planet, would connect directly to what the thing is, what it does, or, or what its use or essence is. So you mentioned, like, spiders. Well, mm-hmm. what do spiders do? Well, they, they, they build a web, and they walk to the corner, and they sit and they wait for the fly to come to them. And in animal medicine, now I didn't know this at the time from like reading books on animal totems, but I certainly understood it from what does a, 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 a spider do? It patiently waits for its abundance to come to it. So this becomes the meaning of the spider. 
So it's not something that I know that you don't know. It's that when I'm listening to a dream, I can do this very, very fast. So that if the dream is about walking to the kitchen and there's a big, big spider and then I, you know, try to kill it and it grows much bigger and, uh, you know, some crazy, weird dream scenario, I'm thinking, oh, kitchen, heart, and heart, the center of the house where everybody comes at a party because it's warm and you're fed there. And the spider is about patience and being, you know, comfortable with waiting for abundance to show up. But, I, you know, the dreamer wants to kill that off because, you know, he or she is impatient, but then it just grows, which means the need or call to be... Be patient about waiting for abundance to show up is greater and greater, and then suddenly the meaning of the dream appears to me as I'm listening to it. So again, it's not that I know things that someone else might not know if they think about the use or the essence or the quality of the thing itself that's showing up in the dream. It's just I can do it so fast that it's like speaking two languages. Well, and you've done it for so long, it sounds like you use a very kind of intuitive part at, you know, to this as well in being able to, you know, to kind of determine what it is that these dreams mean. Yeah, absolutely. There, there is, uh, this is, I think, why at 16, 17, and 18 years old, though I didn't have any idea what I was doing, that when I heard a dream that I was tapping into something that I was, you know, connecting to through Intuition. When I then later learned about what some of the psycho, you know, psychological theorists said about dreams, it was interesting to me that I was in alignment with what they were teaching and, and speaking about. So the, the principles that Jung put forth about the collective unconscious and universality were things that I intuitively connected to. Um, which, again, points to something you sort of alluded to, which is the right person at the right time, that working with dreams was just a gift that I had, and it was inevitable that I would discover that. Well, thank goodness you did, you know, because yeah. <laughs> you know your stuff on this. I've got to ask you, so let's say someone's starting to learn how to interpret their dreams. What are some ways, like some little tips that they can start identifying what certain things mean for them? Well, I would say the first thing that I would say to anybody who's interested in cultivating a deeper experience of their dreams is that there is no right way to work with a dream, that the unconscious mind of a person is expressing itself in a really intimate and revealing way and though, and this is sort of ironic that, you know, you might watch me work with a dreamer and think, oh, that's really satisfying. He really nailed it. Oh, my God, that was so, you know, that felt so right. That, that somehow that working with a dream and interpreting it has to look like that. But the fact is it's really an intimate act between the dream and the dreamer. And if that dreamer happens to come upon me to work through a dream, then their unconscious drew me in to be part of that process. But for the individual who wants to have a richer experience of their own dreams or even working with the dreams of others, the first thing that they have to recognize is that there's no such thing as a wrong interpretation. Well, that that, is that's important. really important because if you do, then the mind just interferes with the process and gets in the way. If you're thinking, oh, is this right? Is this right? Is this right? It's like, no, just go with it. And the second thing to encourage people to do, I think one of the best ways is to break down the dream story into the images that showed up so that you're – you know, the, the, the unconscious is speaking to you in this symbolic language. So the symbols are rich, and they're rich with meaning. And so back to the, the spider dream that we made up on the fly. You know, the, a beautiful way of working with that might just be, say, you, you get a piece of paper and you write out spider, then you write out kitchen, and then you write out, you know, got bigger. And then, you, you know, all of the things that appeared in the dream as separate symbols can be pondered and thought about and ruminated on and then associations can be made and who knows maybe one day you're you're sitting looking at the dream about the spider and then you remember that day when you were eight and you were on the road with your family at that motel room going to the sleepaway camp for visiting day and there was a big spider in the shower and you were terrified and you know then you're thinking about I don't know stuff like that and suddenly the dream has that sort of a meaning 
harkens back to a childhood event. And this is this is certainly how Freud worked with dreams. By making associations, suddenly the dream is reminding you of a fearful moment that came up when you were a child that then might spark you to think about something else. And the association goes and goes and goes, and suddenly now you and your unconscious are having a really interesting conversation with each other. And that's satisfying dream interpretation. It may not be the same as I would do if we were working together in a client session, but it's certainly a rich way for the dreamer in the dream to have an experience in an expressive moment. So what if you have a client that says, you know what, I can't remember my dreams. What advice do you have for someone like that? Certainly, uh, uh, the, the, the intention and the desire to remember dreams is paramount. So that we, we have to start with that. That if a person has that intention and desire, we, we make sure that the, the, the dreamer, you know, works with that intention so that when you go to bed, there is a process or a part of your thought of Preparing for the night's sleep includes asking yourself and telling yourself that you're going to do a better job at remembering dreams in the morning. The second thing that's really important is to have access to a recording device, uh, whether it's a pen and paper or, or your smartphone or, or, or a digital recorder, have it nearby so that when you wake up, it's not an afterthought. Because once you get up and get moving and the mind snaps into attention, the dream is going to disappear. But if the pen and the paper is right next to your bed, you can turn to it immediately. The third thing that I think is probably the most important thing, which kind of connects to intention, Mm -hmm. is to go to that pad and paper even if there isn't a strong memory. That you go straight from waking up to the pad and paper even if what you have to write down is, I don't really remember anything from my dreams last night. Because that act supersedes whether or not the memory of the dream is there and it speaks to the unconscious mind and tells it of that intention and that the intention is important. The, the thing that I think people want to be reminded of or exposed to is, is that it's not so much that you don't remember the dream, it's that the dream is taking place in a different part of the mind than the part of the brain or mind where we have our conscious waking experience. And so it's like keeping a window open. It's that that your brain switches its attention center to the cognitive processes that says, oh, uh, that's right, Uh, it's me, Michael, it's morning, it's my bed, oh my gosh, I've got to get to the bathroom and then I've got to get my coffee. (laughs) Those thoughts are just really loud. And they are louder than the part of the mind slash brain where the dream memory sits. And so all of this is about cultivating, keeping the mind quiet, the waking mind that is, Mm -hmm. quiet enough so that the sleeping, dreaming mind that's still sort of present but dim can be heard. That's, again, why we put the pad and pen right next to our <laughs> our bedside. The bed, yeah. Yeah, so kind we don't interrupt and say, oh, or that thing that happens, you wake up in the middle of the night with a big dream and you say, well, I'll never forget this dream. This is so vivid. <laughs> and then in the morning, not only do you not remember the dream, you don't even remember that you wanted to remember it. <laughs> well, and I'm sure that that happens. I you know some people are like, why? Well, yeah, I go paperless. I put everything on my phone. But once we start getting into you know, all the emails and things like that. I'm sure those oh, yeah. intentions yeah. can get we, lost. We couldn't because... possibly remember that still quiet, imaginative, you know, voice where mm-hmm. dreamland, you know, is. Definitely a very different part of the, the thinking mechanism. Now, in your book, you talk about petitioning dreams. So what does that mean and how can we do it? Well, I think this is one of the most valuable tools for living more consciously, that we have, you know, questions about how to handle a situation that's baffling us or how to process making a decision or anything that we stumble into where we don't have the clarity of how to operate and proceed uh, and, and but maybe we know and recognize that we're in a process of figuring something out. Mm-hmm. Dream petitioning is a wonderful way to involve your unconscious mind's expressiveness to help you, you know, navigate 
this, you know, difficulty of, of, you know, just being a human being in a complicated world. And that looks a little bit like, okay, say relationship issues. You're, you know, you're connecting in a relationship and you don't know if it feels like it's something you want to commit to or, you know, deepen and it's, you're ambivalent and you're, mm. and so you petition your dreams. That is, you, before bed, you ask your dreams to give you information help you make decisions about something that's important to you that you're confused about. Some practitioners of this and teachers of this say that it's even a good idea to get really formal about it and in your dream journal actually write out the request. Hey, unconscious, dear unconscious mind, <laughs> I want to know if I should keep dating so-and-so uh, despite the fact that I'm feeling a little ambivalent. Help me out with the dream. And then see what comes. The thing that's important to remember about dream petitioning is to trust that it's a process that's happening, even if it's not obvious, even if you don't remember a dream and you've asked, that since the unconscious is such a rich place of how we have our being and our expressiveness and our, our sense of self, but it's really unconscious, sometimes just asking the question and having a dream, even if that dream slips outside of our memory, that we are actually advancing our sense of awareness of self by having asked. And sometimes it gets very obvious. I had a client once who was having this very experience of not being sure if this new dating relationship was one that she wanted to continue, that it seemed a little bit similar to a pattern that she and I had been talking about in, in the therapy, and she, I suggested the petitioning of the dream. The dream. And so she, she woke up, and the dream, this was the dream that she was at um, um, an event that was a celebration of a relationship, like an anniversary, and that it, she discovered as the dream progressed that she was actually part of the couple that was being celebrated, um, and that when the partner came into the room who had been behaving badly in the dream, the partner was not like her father, it was literally her father. Oh my gosh. <laughs> and so, well, yeah, right? So it was so obvious and apparent that this dating relationship that she was ambivalent about fell into the category of working out old problems of attracting people that were really more designed for helping her work through an issue than actually designed to spend the rest of her life with. And I don't know that the dream specifically caused her or guided her to end the relationship, but that is the direction that this particular relationship went because her unconscious mind was very clear and was saying, well, honey, this is a daddy dream. This is a daddy relationship. Heal the wound, move on, attract somebody better. <laughs> I'm sure that one stuck in her mind. <laughs> yes, it was, we, 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 fortunately, I have a good sense of humor. So did she. I think we laughed for about 10 minutes. <laughs> I bet, I bet, because some some of the times these dreams, you know, in the way that it delivers information can be somewhat comical, you know. Absolutely, absolutely. Oh my goodness. And 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 uh, beautiful. I, I this was not a dream petition moment, but I uh, was working with someone this morning on a dream, and and the the uh, also similar sort of. Uh, quandary of being, you know, attracted to certain things in life and having a desire to have a deeper and richer experience of, you know, anything, whether it's dating or just making choices that are, are, are serve a person, you know, at a higher level. Um, and this dreamer had a dream of a crow and some owls. And the crow was dead and the owls were eating the crow. Now, in bird medicine, owls are very much about wisdom, not just because we think of the wise old owl, but they're nocturnal, they can turn their heads almost in 360 degrees, so they have the capacity to really see that which we would miss, because they can see in the dark and they can look all around them, so their medicine is about being able to be, uh, you know, to cultivate and have the wisdom that happens when we can see deeply and powerfully in hidden spaces. Crows are attracted to really shiny objects. <laughs> That's true, yeah. Right? So uh -huh. suddenly the dream is saying, 
being attracted to shiny objects, which I would call anything, not just relationship stuff, but anything where it's like the easier, softer way, being attracted to something that's shiny is a sort of like a symbol of not going to a deeper place, but being more superficially satisfied with things in life that are fun and easy, but, that, but don't take as much work. Yeah. And the dream is really expressing that that way for this dreamer is dead. And the wiser parts of the dreamer is actually dining on, feasting on the growth process that's evidented or, you know, made clear by the dead crow. And, you know, the process isn't over. So the dream actually left more questions, I think, than answers. Um, and again, though this dream didn't, dreamer didn't petition the dream specifically, it's similar in the process of letting the dream help the dreamer make a decision. Am I going to go with the easy way that's more superficial that I have a lot of practice with? Mm-hmm. Or am I going to take the risk of taking the, 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 the higher, deeper road that's actually in the direction of the void, of, you know, sort of, you know, walking away from the stimulation that like, is the shiny thing that the crow likes and into a place of stillness and not knowing where my next expression of, you know, abundance, prosperity, and companionship is going to live. Wow. It's just, it's interesting how accurate these dreams can be when um, someone starts to really dive into investigating the symbols that come with them and, and start now. So you talked about having a dream journal. Is that something you suggest that people start to develop so they keep track of their dreams? Absolutely. Especially if you're new to dream work, if it's something that is, uh, 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 you know, a new idea, then yes, just get a dream journal and write everything down. Now, I don't do that any longer because I've been working with my dreams since, you know, for decades and decades and decades. Mm -hmm. Um, So at (laughs) this point, I, you know, I let most dreams fall to the wayside unless and until a dream feels really clear that it wants to be explored by me, and uh, and I know it. I wake up and I like, okay, yeah, this one. Um, but if it's a new uh, uh, idea for for someone, so if somebody's listening to, to this podcast and says, yeah, that sounds like uh, something I'd be curious about, I would invite them to invest in the time and the effort to write every dream down, and then continue writing. It's not. It's it, it's certainly valuable enough to write the dream down in and of itself. Remember, this is like a conversation between the unconscious and the conscious mind. And in some ways, I liken the the unconscious mind to like, you know, the eight-year-old kid at the pool who says, look, ma, and then jumps in. <laughs> and then they get out of the pool, they go to the edge again, and they're like, look, mom, meanwhile, mom's over there trying to read her book. <laughs> and it's not that interesting, but the kid is so craving being witnessed and being watched by mom when he or she jumps and dives into the pool. The unconscious mind's a little bit like that. It simply wants to be seen and attended to. And so writing a dream down does that. And then what happens is it becomes a richer expression. I once was invited at a big crowded gathering in Los Angeles. Someone was doing a teaching, a speaking, a lecture, and they knew that there was a dream interpreter in the house and um, uh, said <laughs> something called out, about right? <laughs> it. Yeah, it was actually Marion Williamson. And, um, and she, someone oddly enough that day asked for uh, a question about dreams, and she had been alerted that I was there because I was being introduced to her after the after the lecture. And she said, "Isn't there someone who does dreams in the house?" And I stood up and I I uh, answered the question. And someone else came up to me um, and uh, said, "Hey, I don't rem- remember my dreams. What can I do?" And I gave her all of the tips that I just outlined with you, and. Um, she came to my local dream circle about 10 days later, and she's like, oh, my God, the floodgate opened up. And while this is an extreme example of that happening, this Mm -hmm. does occur, that when you start writing your dreams down, they get bigger. They get more vivid. They get more memorable. They get more frequent. 
because the unconscious mind is craving that we see it, know it, and interact with it. And dreams is really one of the most easy, profound, and ubiquitous ways to connect with what the unconscious mind wants to express. And once we open that door, bang, get ready. (laughs) Off off you go to the races, right? That's right. (laughs) Right. And then if you want to take it deeper, write a little bit more, you know. So if it's a journal, treat it as a journal. And the first part of your writing be the dream description. And then let the second part of the writing be, well, what does that make you feel? What were the thoughts that it sparked in you? Are there memories associated? Is there childhood stuff there? Is there anxiety? Is there fear? Is there joy and delight? You know, write about it. And again, there's no right way or wrong way to to be with a dream in this fashion. It's, you know, it's just, it's a very intimate experience between the dreamer and the process. Well, I think I have time for one more question here because this is just such an interesting discussion. And I know in your book you talk about if someone dreams in color versus black and white, what is, if any, is the significance of that? Well, you know, I think that the irony is is that there's some notion that when a dream is remembered as having vivid color, that the ipso facto of that is is that other dreams are black and white. And I just don't really think that's the case, though who knows, it might be. But it's the idea that uh, in the spirit of some moments being higher stakes than others, moments being more passionate or even just more important, that color is one of the ways that we sort of exhibit the power of expressiveness, that that colors being more vivid indicates a presence of more passion, of more importance, of more significance. And so I think that that's one of the reasons why they stand out as memorable. So back a few minutes ago when I said, uh, you know, that I don't work with all my dreams, but I know when one is important enough to dream, uh, to, 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 to work with, one could even say that a dream being remembered as being particularly vivid, as colorful, could be the unconscious mind's way of saying, pay attention to this one, this one counts more. And so I'm emphasizing the texture and the the emotional content um, of what I'm trying to convey to you, hey, conscious dreamer, by upping the volume and the, you know, the, the intensity of the color experience. Mm. Well, and so, Dr. Michael, where can our, because I know um, your book was just released, Llewellyn's yes. Little Book of Dreams, and it's available at all major retailers and, of course, on Amazon and Barnes & Noble. Where can our listeners connect with you and be part of your community? MichaelLennox.com is the website, um, and I'm also pretty active on Facebook at Michael Lennox. I also have a professional page on Facebook that is Perchance to Dream. Hmm. Well, I know I'm part of your community. I highly suggest everyone become part of your community as well. You know, Dr. Michael, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show with us today. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. It's been a joy. We are going to pause here for a quick break, and we'll be right back after these messages. Internationally recognized and award-winning author Judy Goodman works and teaches outside the box of limited thinking. Working with people from every walk of life, her goal is to empower you to be the best you can be, no matter what the challenge is. Born with the gift of seeing beyond our normal vision, she has an extraordinary gift of working with every challenge. Teaching beyond conventional wisdom, her work is described as life-changing. Visit JudyGoodman.com. That's JudyGoodman.com. Have you ever had the sense that your thoughts might actually be doing something? Ancient secrets of manifesting have been masterfully revealed in the award-winning book Manifesting 123 by Ken Elliott. For the first time, the author's experiences and stories in this book describe exactly how your thoughts can create anything. 
You've been doing this all your life, but it's never been fully explained for you until now. Visit Manifesting123.com for more information today. Manifesting123.com Ben Wexler is a gifted leadership development and strategy consultant for professionals who want to transform their organizations and careers. Through a uniquely personalized set of processes, participants discover their unique knowledge, how to leverage that knowledge and experience, and then put it all together with a global strategy. You're more valuable, your organization is more valuable, and the change is viral. Contact Ben at 630-881-1074, 630-881-1074. This is Jennifer McGill. My highly anticipated new album, Unbreakable, is now available at jennifermcgill.com. Everything from power ballads to high-energy jam-out-in-your-car songs, I used my highest joys and deepest pains to create empowering songs of love, strength, healing, and restoration so that you can be unbreakable too. Get your copy of Unbreakable today from jennifermcgill.com. Because who doesn't want to be unbreakable? back to Moments with Marianne. I am so delighted to be introducing our next guest, Gabriela Gulimonte Trivel, and she's here today to talk to us about her new book, Antarctic Odyssey. Now, Gabriella is an Italian linguist who started working in Italy as a tour guide and interpreter and then moved to the UK in 1998. Now, Gabriella is trained in NLP and investigated several alternative therapies, including Reiki, Orosoma, aromatherapy, hypnotherapy, and the work of Byron Katie, which all gave her a better and holistic understanding of the human being that we are. So let's welcome to the show, Gabriella. Thank you, Marianne. Thank you so much for having me on your radio show. I'm so really excited about it. Oh, well, what a joy it is to have you here. I mean, so you've done what a lot of people haven't. I mean, you've, you've kind of gone to places that takes a lot of courage. But before we get into your journey, I have to ask you, what prompted you to start on this path? Um. Mm, good question. Um, <laughs> we should maybe first state uh, or decide when the, the path starts because <laughs> actually it's something I, 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 I wrote about in the book, <laughs> meaning, uh, but where does it actually start? Because if you think, oh, yes, my journey started when that happened at that age, blah, blah, blah. But then if you look into it long enough, then two minutes maybe, you'll see that there is another event that happened before that is as equally as important. So it's a bit difficult to, 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 to answer by, maybe we should, uh, maybe we should state first what, what was uh, the most recent path. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, so, okay, I, I went through a kind of real life crisis um, between 2005 and 2007. And um, during that time, uh, lots of things that I, I took for granted or I consider normal life disappeared. And so <laughs> I find myself a bit like kind of uh, when they, you know, they, they pull the rug below your feet, you feel a bit wobbly. <laughs> yeah. So I felt for, for a while. And uh, that kind of uh, helped me to review and re-see look at it, my life again and um, so if we look at that consider that period as the trigger of me then eventually going to Antarctica that could be my answer <laughs> well and I think a lot of people it they can relate because sometimes it does take a life-altering situation for us to really look at things and decide to make you know like drastic changes and sometimes that involves being able to 
do something that we probably would not normally do, but maybe we've always wanted to do. Now, was your Antarctic trip always something that was something that was kind of calling to you, or was it something that just kind of came up as, you know, part of your journey as well? Well, funny enough, um, yes, I, I have the travel bug, and possibly I will always have that mm-hmm. <laughs> as long as I live, but uh, I never considered to go to Antarctica. It wasn't on my bucket list or dream list or goal list or whatever you might prefer to call it, simply because I like warm climates, <laughs> and it's definitely not warm there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, would, to answer your question, I think it would... The honest answer would be no. It just happened to be passing my way when I was uh, looking for kind of uh, anything that would bring me back to life. And as as I do enjoy traveling, and um, I find myself in a in a point where psychologically and emotionally I was really rock bottom. And at the same time, um, whatever you want to consider life, the higher consciousness or whatever, lending me with a bit of money that I could use. And instead of doing uh, something normal, I thought uh, to take the opportunity <laughs> and to do something strange. <laughs> it <was so> <laughs> now, when you went on this journey, I understand you went with a group of people. Is that correct? Yes, it was. Now, was this a group of people who were kind of doing the same thing? They were having, it, it was more for like a consciousness or a spiritual kind of awakening journey? Yeah, or? yeah it wasn't um, uh, a trip that I just booked on a, a travel brochure or something like that. No, I, I just want, at the time I was living um, still in London, in UK. I still live in UK, but not in London anymore. Um, and I just um, just finished with my divorce proceeding. I just been to the second hearing, court hearing, that eventually signed off the end of it. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was a kind of acrimonious process and etc. etc. So I heard from a friend about this event uh, where there were different speakers and uh, there was one who happened to be an Australian guy who was actually saying to people, come to Antarctica with me. And so uh, I, I thought, ooh, <laughs> let's go and <laughs> check, it, check him out. And I had a... Um, I had a chat with him, like I'm having with you, but he was in person, and and I had a strange feeling because I had in front of me somebody who was definitely a male, <laughs> but uh, that happened to do something that I would, I thought uh, I would like to do in life, which is taking people on this type of strange adventures, and I saw I find it really contagious, and I thought, uh, ooh, I have to check this out. And also on top of that, there was the fact that he was exactly as you said, taking a group of people that that, that had the same purpose, which was facing fears or facing your limiting beliefs. And I just trained uh, in neuro-linguistic programming the year before. And so I find it quite appealing to me because I thought, oh, well, another opportunity to test myself (laughs) as if I didn't have had enough already before, but anyway, <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm that type of soul. So I, I just thought, oh yes, we had to. Do, I had to do this, and yes, the 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 um, for me, it was quite of um, breaking through, you know, the financial thing because it was pretty expensive thing to do, and uh, I had been uh, living on a shoestring for a long time. Uh, besides having to pay all these legal fees, as one does when you go, you go through divorce and stuff. And so I think uh, maybe it was even just deciding on something so crazy. It was in itself a breakthrough for me. And then uh, the nine months that were happ- happening before the, the trip in itself, it was not a, a hell because, you know, your mind is a, a good, <laughs> it's like a drum of a witch where everything is there, you know, boiling. <laughs> well, and it must have been so empowering to go with a group of people who are looking to overcome 
you know, one, either a fear or a limiting belief, but are looking to kind of, you know, kind of move together in, in kind of a way um, through some of these adversities that they had been struggling with. Well, yeah, because then you have the synergy of the group. At the same time, not to be all rose and roses and uh, pinky, lovely souls. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's also challenging, even more so, because, um, uh, yeah, um, you know, you can uh, you can have uh, clashes with kind of big personalities and stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm <I> sure. <laughs> Just to be on the real <laughs> side of things. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, you get a few type A personalities in there other than the instructor, you know, the person who's organized the trip, and I'm sure it can lead for some interesting dynamics. But, I, you know, overall, I, I, it's got to be interesting to take these kind of journeys with a group of people that are looking to kind of accomplish the same thing. Yes, it is. I agree with you. And um, and funnily enough, I'm quite uh, of a, um, um, how to call it, I'm very much a, a, a self-trigger purse type of person, meaning uh, I I, um, I don't rely on other people's motivation. Of course, I'm a human being as well. So I live in a society, so I, I am influenced like everybody is by comments of others and I, I read books, etc. So, but I'm quite a um, self-initiating type of person. So um, I was really, in a way, um, I was looking at this trip before going and wondering what it could be, you know, my, my, my um, sore spots, you know, what it could be for me the challenge because I was thinking, well, but I'm okay with outdoors. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm a type of uh, sporty woman, you know, <laughs> etc. Yeah. etc. So in a way, I was really looking into the cauldron and trying to find what it could be my challenge. And as it happens, life always knows better than you, meaning you, me, everybody. And so I was served the perfect challenge. (laughs) (laughs) And and, uh, of course, I I tell all about it in the book, but it's funny. I'm saying it in a very humble, from a very humble heart. It, It really cracked me open. It really, uh, you know, it's... I, I, it made me totally useless I, I because the thing that I was looking forward the most that for me it was um, something to really look forward to uh, I love taking pictures uh, I like for, I like I love photography I like uh, um, yeah the visual you know and for me and nature by the way so for me to go to Antarctica uh, it was such a, uh, in a way, a super, super privilege because I can't really think of places on earth they are, they, or they should more prestand than that, right? Mm-hmm. But well, <laughs> it, it, yeah, it, it's also such a challenging landscape as well, you know. So, yeah. I was looking forward to, to see all the possible different shades of the blue of the eyes and I was thinking of all these things. I was, you know, imagining and I was um, fantasizing about all this stuff. And what happened, I, I, I lost all my gear uh, right at the beginning. So I was, I was, I was a wreck. <laughs> oh, no. Well, and I, you, didn't you spend a night like, camping on the ice as well? I spent two nights uh, camping on the ice, but that was uh, later on in the in the trip. Uh, what happened uh, that uh, uh, pulled away everything from me? It was just right at the beginning, and to be honest, it could have been life threatening because it was um, a huge iceberg that actually actually collapsed into the sea, as icebergs do, right? Yeah. <laughs> That, that they wasn't what you, what you guys were camping on, was it? <laughs> so. Oh, no. I was actually, in that moment, I was ice climbing. <laughs> oh. oh, wow. <laughs> and so I had a, a wonderful view of it and uh, feeling like uh, I was really in the flesh, like in one of those uh, uh, um, 
uh, Ocean and Geographic uh, type of documentaries. Mm-hmm. And not realizing that, um, yeah, my rucksack was on the beach. <laughs> <laughs> and it didn't take long for the tsunami to reach us. <laughs> oh, my goodness. That is well, and so I mean, with that, you know, this kind of um, this kind of the temperature, the landscape, the challenges that come with it, really push a person to their limits. So it really does. It's almost like a rebirth in many ways. You know, when you go out there spiritually and you're ready to kind of pull back and and look at different things that have happened and kind of reexamine life. Um, and then on top of that, you are physically challenged and probably emotionally challenged with everything going on. It must have been quite a journey. It, it was. Uh, it was, even if in, in itself the, the period uh, that we, we sailed through the Antarctic Peninsula, it wasn't that long. But mm-hmm. I have to say, um, I'm, I'm, I tend to minimize stuff. Um, is, is part of my behavior. I'm very conscious of it. So uh, I, um, I, can, I can manage to make everything small. So even that, it was small, right? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I, I mean, I'm looking at, okay, so they got polar bears. There's all sorts of different, you know, there are predators out there. So it's not like you're just hanging out. <laughs> no, no, Matt, what I want to really share from the, from the bottom of my heart is this, that um, yeah, for me, the, that was challenging for sure because it, it hit my ego or my creativity or whatever. It doesn't matter. But uh, what uh, for me was life transforming, one of the many things, but maybe the, the strongest was uh, the contact with nature. Mm-hmm. And um, I had the privilege. I, 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 it happened fortuitously uh, by, by chance, but... Uh, uh, I had uh, the, the chance to look into a, a minky whale's eye at a distance of few centimeters because I was sitting in a dinghy and this whale just decided to surface and have a look at me. And to me, in that moment, it was like kind of I lost a consciousness of what was time and space. I just... Um, I don't know. You, you, beca- you feel like one with everything else. And, and it's like a kind of a mystic moment. And the same happened to me also when I went night camping on the ice. And, and you know, I, I couldn't really sleep so much because it was blooming cold. <laughs> <laughs> and even, if, even if we had all possible gear, <laughs> I, yeah. I, couldn't, I couldn't sleep. And... Um, and uh, realizing, I was imagining that a place like that is absolutely silent. <laughs> it's absolutely, <laughs> it's so deafening because there's so much noise. Uh, na- nature can be very, very noisy. And definitely the ice is noisy because it moves. So you have cracks and loud clashes, you know, thump all the time. And when you are on a little uh, islet that is as big as, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, like a building block, not bigger than that, and uh, you have uh, you are surrounded by frozen sea, and you have ice everywhere, and you hear all these noises, and it's pitch bar- dark, and you can't sleep. Something happens to your consciousness. <laughs> 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 you just say, "Well, whatever it is is, I'm part of this. I hope I can be." still living tomorrow morning. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think anyone who is new to that environment would probably think the same thing without being like an expert in, in um, traveling in that kind of an uh, area and that kind of environment, you know, because it, it does, I mean, you've got the ice cracking and making noise and critters coming up surfacing and, you know, if, if there are whales nearby they're not quiet, you know, so you, you're getting a lot of this happening. What were some of the just surprising things that you learned, you know, on this trip? Um, 
I actually, in the book, really, not, not to refer back to that continuously, but it really, what I've done, I narrated what, what happened during that, that span of time, but also I kind of uh, squeezed my soul to kind of list, you know, what, what came up to my consciousness, uh, mainly to have a list for myself, and then, you know, <laughs> and then uh, if it can be of help for others, I would be super happy. Um Many things, um, but I was saying uh, nature for me was the biggest element, and I think because um, nature it kind of rips you off of all the layers, meaning that y y you you feel more your mortality and you feel quite naked. I would say, you know, in many in many ways. Even if you might have four or five layers on you, but uh, you really, even just feeling the wind below your those four or five layers and you feel it in your navel, you know, it's kind of an experience. And, and really makes you feel um, so minute. And so everything gets into a different perspective because we tend to, in our normal life, we tend to, everything is magnified and it could be a minute thing that actually means nothing ultimately in our life. But uh, because we are in a normal contest, you know, we look at it like something really major. Whereas when you remove yourself from your normal environment, it really help you to help you to to see things differently. It's a bit like flying. Uh, I like flying um, and and flying not with uh, airlines. I mean, uh, flying in a glider, a small plane, you know. Mm -hmm. So you feel more the the contact. Uh, again it, it, with nature and the elements and again I think it's a similar thing because it gives you the opportunity to see things from above and everything becomes very m minute and it's like uh, when I was you know camping overnight and I was immersed in this pitch black light <laughs> mm -hmm. and everything seems huge in my mind but actually I realized it was nothing it's it's, it's so, you realize, okay, who am I? And I didn't have an answer for that. <laughs> <laughs> well, and it, it just sounds like a, a trip like this and the experience you went through and how you're, you're discussing about it really puts things in perspective. You get that kind of bird's eye view where, you know, some of the things that might have been bothering you before or were huge problems you kind of are able to separate and move back a little bit, look at the bigger picture, and it's like, okay, well, yeah, that's that might not be the greatest situation, but it's not the end. You know, it's there's so much more, especially when you're in environments like that. It's so much more that there is, um, not just for you, but I'm sure for with the people that you work with. Yeah, and also. <laughs> You know, it's something I would encourage anybody to do if by any chance you, you, you are in a point of your life where, where really it seems that nothing has meaning anymore because it, it can happen. It happens to all of us sooner or later. It's just, I think, uh, the purpose of life, you know, to, to serve us moment like that when you kind of, you review and... and in, in, in fact, we are part of nature, so I can't really think of something that can teach you more than that. Well, nature as such, I mean, fauna and flora, etc., that don't, don't, doesn't use word. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so maybe you have to kind of listen in a different way, not just with your mind, uh, more with your heart, maybe. Um, that's why, funnily enough, um, at the end of the story, um, I thought, okay, I, I, I listed, I thought to list it, uh, in a, like an appendix, uh, all the lessons. And, and I was thinking, okay, but there will be a situation in the, my future where nothing of, of this is applicable. Why? Because, because life knows best, right? Yeah, for sure. <laughs> you know, and I thought, ah, uh, oh, I need a jolly. You know, like in in a in a game of cards, you know, you you have the jolly, which is or the joker. I don't know mm -hmm. which I'm using the states, but is it kind of a card you can use for your missing one that you need? You know, and so I, I asked myself. Um, 
oh, okay, now, and what if <laughs> that time comes and uh, none of these lessons I listed is applicable? What shall I do? And, uh, and so I, I um, again, uh, a few years later, because I wrote this uh, in 2011 and I went on the trip in 2008. Mm -hmm. So I thought, what is this lesson? I want, I need this lesson. And so um, I, I uh, after long pondering, I, 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 I find it and, um, and it's the following. And it's the last, uh, last line of my book, which is, life is a journey of the heart. The mind is only a helper and the soul is the adventurer. And that, goes with what I was saying, you know, that sometimes in those moments of silence when you don't know anything anymore, they are very much birthing into you something that maybe needs to come out, you know, it could be your next stage or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, it's very important to listen with with the heart, um, meaning not the necessarily the heart, the physical heart, but... <laughs> Uh, meaning the soul or not the mind because the mind um, uh, chatters all the time <laughs> and not necessarily with important stuff you know so well and it's interesting when you take a trip like this and you look back and look at the lessons sometimes they're so much different than what we think we're going to you know receive during that trip you know Yes, absolutely. And, and I'm sure it wasn't a chance uh, that I wrote it so much later. What the, the, the story goes that I wanted actually to produce a documentary and I, for obvious reason, technical reason, mm -hmm. <laughs> I couldn't. I had very little of what I wanted to obviously get while I was there. And so I persisted with my, with my purpose and but I, I, nothing was happening, and nothing was uh, helping me out with it. And and so three years later, which is you know a pretty long time, yeah, uh, I just realized, oh, hang on a minute, Gabriella Guglielmino Titrivel, why don't you start writing something? At least, at least, it's something that you can give to somebody who might be interested, in maybe producing the documentary. But at least it's something that has got a, a start and a finish, right? Rather than just your thoughts. And so, and so in uh, two weeks, I wrote the book. Well, and I know that you have this also wrapped into a lot of the work that you do as well. So, and um, and we'll get to that in a little bit. I just kind of want to still touch on on the book and and your journey here. Um, so, you're having to leave. You know, Antarctica. How did you feel about all of that at the time? When I came back? Mm-hmm. Ah, oh, oh, I can uh, tell you two things that I think were pivotal moments for me back then. Um, well, one was um, the trip. We were on a ship, and uh, it was just chartered for our group, and uh, it was sailing down the Antarctic Peninsula, which is, uh, compared to the whole continent, quite a small uh, little appendix on the top of the... I, I think you can fit uh, uh, the whole Antarctica, um, Europe, and um, I can't remember which other continent. I mean, it's enormous, okay? Yeah. So, and I remember uh, thinking... Uh, yeah, oh, but we'll just see a little bit, blah, 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 which is the mind again talking, you know. Um, and I remember that at the end of that uh, 10 days, those 10 days, uh, you know, when eventually we, 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 we turned back and went back to Ushuaia, which was the place in uh, southern um, Argentina where we took off. I remember because it's been it been so intense for me i remember feeling a sense of relief like if i had been to hell and and i was coming back now you know <laughs> and and I was, the mind was saying but no gabriella but what are you thinking are you mad but you should be sad and you know and 
no, there was in me something that uh, it really felt like going to hell. <laughs> and so going back, it was such a relief. So um, that was one, it, it was quite shocking, but very revealing in the moment. And then I remember, well, after the, that trip, I went on on my own uh, traveling South America and uh, before going back to UK. But again, I had another moment when uh, I was already back in London after this uh, outrageously strange, uh, life-changing, uh, uh, expensive trip, you know. And I, I remember thinking one day, I woke up and in the morning, and I was in the shower, and all of a sudden, because I had a, a, a bit of a kind of shock, uh, cultural shock when I went back, mm -hmm. it, I mean, how could it be, you know? I mean, um, from the prairies of Patagonia, you find yourself back in, in, in a very populated place like London. And, and on top of that, I was trying to go back to my normal life, and I couldn't really fit back in. And I remember that I had this uh, insight, um, a bit like the moment when I realized, oh, it wasn't that bad, actually, to, to go back, right? I, rem I realized, oh, Okay, are you challenged enough, girl, yourself, you know, through life? Now, what is your next challenge this time? Because, I mean, to go further than what you've done this time is a kind of um, a bit challenging in itself. Uh, what can you put on your list? To go to Mars? You know, that could be a bit <laughs> But yeah, then, yeah. but you like that it was really uh, an eye opener, and I tell you why, because I could see my pattern of behavior of, um, you know, always wanting <laughs> something mm. more challenging, more difficult, but, but I realized maybe I didn't want to do that all my life. So it was quite so a sobering moment. Um, and it was kind of, um, yes, it was a turning point as well. Now, Gabriella, if people would like to connect with you, learn more about your book, Antarctic Odyssey, A New Beginning, where could they go? Uh, simply on my website, which is flyinginspiration.com. Flying, uh, like uh, the act of flying, F-L-Y-N-G, inspiration, written in one word, dot com. Because uh, I've been calling myself since 2005, don't know why, because it just came to me. Uh, I've been calling myself a flying inspiration. So, <laughs> Aww. well, I think that's perfect, especially with your with your travels and um, also. In, I know you do some coaching and stuff like that as well. You know, Gabriella, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show with us today. Thank you so much, Marianne, for having me and giving me the opportunity to, to possibly touch somebody else's life. Oh, thank you so much, Gabriella. It has been such a joy to spend this time with you. You are a light and inspiration to so many. We are at the end of our time today. I'd like to thank everyone for taking the time to tune in. And remember, make every moment count. In a single moment, your life can change. Moments with Marianne is a transformative hour that covers an endless array of topics with the best of the best. Her guests are leaders in their fields, ranging from inspirational authors, top industry leaders, and business and spiritual entrepreneurs. Each guest is gifted and a true visionary. A recognized leader in her own work, and while teaching others to develop, refocus, and grow, Marianne will bring the best guest and sometimes a special surprise. Don't miss this. You never know just which moment will change your life forever. Moments with Marianne airs every Thursday, Friday, and Sunday at 8 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Mountain Time. Make sure to tune in and visit momentswithmarianne.com for more information.